Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the FIDE Candidates 2022, an eight-player double round robin, which means they play 14 games, the winner of which qualifies to play the world champion, Magnus Carlsen, although there is a bit of an asterisk attached to that if you're just joining us in the middle of this marathon event. Magnus has said that he might not be interested in defending his title, depending on who he plays against. Anyway, throughout all these recaps, I've been wearing flashy shirts. Today is no exception. And today, for the first day uh, out of the first five rounds, Magnus joined, uh, obviously, the Chess24 live broadcast. And oh my goodness, folks, did he say a bunch of amazing things, which I'm going to share with you throughout this recap. I made a list. I made a list before we jump into the games. He started off by saying, so far, nobody, in his opinion, to be frank, has played particularly well. Wow. That is incredible. Then he said Fabiano Caruana, uh, he thought, made a bad decision in round two, not playing on against Jan. Then he said, whether Ferruja is managing his time badly or is nervous, he said Ferruja looks like he's always nervous. Then he said he doesn't care about the dress code, uh, that Hikaru had some issues with the dress code. He said that uh, he always requires that he doesn't have to wear a tie. Oh my god, and then it goes on and on. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sprinkle some more of these. Let me know in the comments your thoughts on all this. I was having such a great time listening to Magnus, and then specifically his commentary on the games. Let's jump in with this game between Ferruja and Duda. Uh, Ferruja obviously struggling. One and a half out of four, just lost to Nepo yesterday, looking to bounce back. And he plays against Duda, and we have a Petrov defense. So we have seen Knight c6 played, Bishop b5. We've seen this quite a bit. I don't believe we've seen a single Italian, actually. Um, but we have a Petrov in this game. Knight takes e5, and now, shockingly, Eric Rosen uh, it, uh, cries in a corner. Uh, as uh, the move knight c6 does not get played, so we do not have a uh, we do not have a Stafford Gambit. Um, d6, knight f3, and now d4 d5. This is a very popular position in the Petrov defense. White now has uh, really one central developing plan around playing the move bishop to d3 and undermining the black center with c4. And then there's a bunch of other things like you can put your knight on c3, you can put your knight on d2, but in reality it is black who chooses the setup that they want to do. Like black has played. Everything. I mean, black has played bishop to e7, bishop to d6, pawn to c6, knight to c6, bishop to g4, bishop to f5. There are a lot of setups. And Duda plays bishop f5. He's played this a lot. If you check the database, it's like do 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 Okay. Um, sorry. He's just got a great name, honestly. But it's a lot of Duda. So we have castles developing with bishop to e7, rookie one. And now you can bet that most likely white will play c4 soon. Uh, and white will either play knight c3 or knight bd2. Ali Reza chooses to play uh, knight bd2. And black does not want to take this knight because what happens is white actually just grabs the bishop. This knight is sort of clumsy. You would think that you would be taking it, but you don't. The knight has nothing it can capture except this. And two bishops versus one without any resistance, white is just better. That is why black goes back to d6 and tries to trade like this. Uh, now, I think Duda actually played this against Magnus uh, in some online event. And the thing is, if you've played Magnus and successfully implemented something in an opening, you're probably going to play it again in the candidates. Now, uh, depending on what Ferruccia's preparation was, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but he was spending quite a bit of time uh, in this game. So it seems like yeah, this is just a very reliable line. Uh, and Ali Reza goes for this setup where you reroute the knight to g3, making this bishop make a decision. The bishop captures queen d3. Uh, and now the knight develops out to a6 with a fake idea maybe of going to b4, but really back to c7, maybe back toward the middle, because uh, the knight isn't and, and isn't really going to go to c6. And black is completely fine. I mean, Stockfish says 0.3, really doesn't mean a whole lot here. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, we will... Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to keep rolling. Bishop d2 prevents uh, the knight from coming to the b4 square, so the knight reroutes this way. And believe it or not, all of these moves... 15 moves by both players, a grand total of 30 moves played. Duda had before. In 2021, in Krasnaya Poliana, if you don't know, I speak Russian, by the way, I said that with no accent. Uh, so Bishop goes to f6, uh, and Duda had the move Bishop to a5, played against him by Puya Idani of Iran. That game was played in the World Cup in 2021. In this game, Ali Reza plays the move Rook a d1. Not an improvement. Uh, Stockfish really likes the idea c5 by white, and then says that black should jump into the middle here, give up a pawn, but in giving up a pawn, uh, this pawn sort of comes under fire. And then, you know, queen d7, rook d8 if necessary, and it's really difficult for white to hang on to this pawn because there's also tactics over here. So, rook a d1, and uh, we have a trade. 
we have another trade, then we have another trade, and bishop to a5. Again, played also by Puyi Dani, but in a slightly different position. You can also go to h5 in this position and try to get this. So bishop a5 pins the knight to the queen. Uh, Duda immediately tries to do something about the, this. Uh, takes. And this is maybe Ali Reza's uh, moment to play knight e4, knight h5. So he plays knight to e4. Queen back to d8. And here, uh, again, uh, logical move, a4, undermining the black position, to which Duda just calmly defends. So Duda's just playing a game of cat and mouse. Like, you create a threat, you put pressure, I, I, you know, I defend it. You put pressure, I defend it. You put pressure, I defend it. And Ali Reza, at this point, is, uh, you know, he's got a nice-looking position. He's been making a lot of, like, different pokes and prods at the position, but he can't do anything. I mean, somehow, Duda's just defended everything masterfully. So what does Ali Reza do? As his time is running low, he was down like an hour in this game again, which is why Magnus said what he said. Now we begin what's called mass simplification. Boop, 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 boop. So the rook has to go back uh, to b1, and now a very nice tactical idea. Queen takes d4. Uh, obviously, this cannot take because mate. This cannot take not because of queen takes queen. Do not hang mate yourselves, bozos. You gotta take the rook. And uh, queen back to f1. There's no mate, this is just a draw. Uh, you know, I feel like if I gave this position to uh, maybe a hundred beginners, we would see all sorts of goofy results. But this is just a draw, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, something kind of similar happens. The queens stay on the board. We have a little repetition of moves. And uh, yeah, I mean, Ali Reza was unable to pose problems in something that Duda had played quite a few times. So very interesting here. I mean, very interesting stuff. Uh, Duda has played this before, a decent amount, and um, Magnus had not commented uh, a tremendous amount on this game, uh, but, you know, or, or like on Duda specifically. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, a draw. So Duda continues being solid, Ali Reza has got to find some wins somewhere at some point. The next game I have for you, Rajaba versus Ding Liren. Uh, Rajabov has struggled in this event uh, with black, but with white, he's been he's been quite solid, and he goes for a Catalan. We have bishop b4, and uh, the players just play a bunch of natural developing moves. Bishop g2 develops the bishop. That puts a pawn in the center. That develops a knight. That looks to Fianchetto, the queenside bishop. This tries to Fianchetto this bishop. Notice Ding Liren moved his knight, and everybody for the first 10 moves was just developing. That's it. But by this point, we have tension, and um, uh, it's actually funny. Magnus also did not say a whole lot about this game, but there was uh, two games after this where he, he really chimed in on all four players involved, uh, and uh, you can look forward to those comments. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, amazing to start the broadcast with nobody has impressed me with their play thus far. <laughs> it's just, it's like a king sitting in his throne watching the gladiators, right? In the Colosseum. I mean, it's, it's just, oh God. So, very tense position, right? I mean, a lot to calculate. Who's going to take what, where? Can white play a3, forcing the bishop to capture? I don't know, but we have c takes d5. Ding plays this move because if you take with the pawn, I mean, what are you doing to your bishop? There's no, right? So he decides to play bishop takes d5. Um, queen to e2 maybe prepares e4. And now Ding takes in the center, making Rajabov make a decision. What is Rajabov going to take with? He chooses the knight, inviting a trade of light squared bishops, which occurs. The knight goes to e5, the pawn goes here. And the real question is, will white play f4 and kind of risk it for the biscuit? Uh, rook fd8 played, rook takes rook, rook takes, and there it is with f4. And potentially e5. The thing about e5 is that... It's not clear if you improved your position doing this or massively ruined it. I mean, like, who cares if you can take the space? Black has a file. I mean, the queen can come here or like this way or even fight you on that diagonal. It's not like you can continue to go forward because you're going to lose your pawns in the center of the board at some point. But Rajambov can really take some risk here if he wants, right? But he plays knight c4 and then a3. And Ding here plays bishop c5 and b5, and all of a sudden things are looking loose. I mean, you got, you got a buffet of things right here. That black has an eye on every one of those pieces. Ding is feeling good at this point. He's like, wait a second, maybe I can get some winning chances with black. And the only thing Magnus said about this game was that right around here, Rajabov might be thinking like, uh, or, or if Magnus was sitting in Rajabov's shoes, he would be going, why, why, why did I do all of this? He had such a nice, I had such a nice and safe position, you know? 
Um, because now after knight d2, uh, pandemonium is going to break loose quite soon. Ding begins rerouting. This is just a useful, flexible move to, you know, always have a left. Rook e2, bishop back to b6. And um, it's a tense moment. We have a potential repetition, but Ding plays h5. And the idea of h5 is, of course, to always throw in a possibility of attacking over here. But there's other ideas. There are ideas uh, like, for example, uh, knight to g4. Which, you know, if, the, if this position opens up, like, for example, let's say white plays e5 here. You see this pin? Now knight g4 is a massive possibility because of the pin. So that is actually, like, h5 is a fascinating idea. And now, ding, that, I mean, look at that knight. I mean, that's amazing. The tide of the game is completely shifting to ding, who, by the way, is constantly inviting repetitions to get closer to the 40th move, right? So rook c8. Queen d3, knight g4, all right, now you can't go back to c2, b4, but that gives away the c4 square, right? The square right in front of it, and look at this rook. I mean, Ding is doing everything right. All of his five pieces are flowing forward at a constant rate of motion. It seems like he's putting things together here. Queen e2, queen b7, poking and prodding, poking and prodding. And things got very tense when on move 39, the move e5 happened. And Ding has an option to take the knight, take the pawn, or lock it down. Okay, lock the position, make one more move, gain that hour, and try to win this game. But he takes, which is also completely fine. But he has to take the knight. You see, white can go knight g5. Like, let's, I, I, I can't really give a move back to white, but like, white does have his own ideas, right? So... You can stop that by playing bishop d4, and then if knight g5 blocking it, and you win. And the other idea of bishop takes knight is that somehow, depending on how white captures, you have counterplay. Like knight takes d4, this is an incredible idea to get down to h1. And the game goes on, but black is better. If bishop takes d4, then even knight f5 is good, and the long-term pressure is going to be a problem. Queen c6 prevents the knight from moving again. But ding! On the final move to get his hour, plays g6. And now this comes and now we have a problem because by the time queen a8 arrives, the knight has already moved. So this happens, and if Ding had not played g6, the knight would have been back here. But now Rajabov plays this, and that's it. Ding misses a golden opportunity at the buzzer of move 40. The players simplify and agree to a draw after 50 moves because you're not going to win this endgame in the candidates. So Ding missing this moment. He missed the moment against Rapport. He misses a moment here. Just one move. The 40th move he had to make. Maybe he would win this game. Maybe. But opportunity slips. Rajab a very clutch defensive resource with Knight G5. And now, folks, we are going to begin uh, looking at two games which really, really captivated the, the live audience. Um, and um, yeah, so... One of the things about this game is that Report repeats what he played against Duda. You'll remember that Duda played uh, d4, takes, takes, knight c6, bishop f4. So we don't know what Report is going to play. Like, we have no idea. Will Report play a classical Taimanov? Will he play a6 Taimanov? Will he play this? Un unlikely, but he might play, you know, the knight f6 variation. Um, he does go for a6, which is the second most popular line. And here Fabiano plays something like the 14th most popular move. It has been played before, it does get played, but it is super off the deep end. You can play bishop e3, you can play a million moves here with white, but what is g4? Is this a modified Sicilian grab? It is a move. The point is that there are various moments where g5 will hit the knight or just prevent it from moving there entirely. And maybe white will do something like this, and by the time white castles have a lot of space, it's a weird move and it has been played it has been played so i mean it's not i mean i guess it's not bogus but it's it's a crazy move we're already like super in the, off the deep end 97 played by report so he has completely abandoned this idea and he's looking to go here to immediately take advantage of the swiss cheese dark squares uh bishop e3 played and you might be wondering around here uh where is the magnus commentary on the players well what Magnus said, uh, as Report traded off the knight and got this position, bishop g2, uh, and developed his knight to g6 to go over here. By the way, no games ever played in this position, as you might imagine, because 
which is crazy. It's like move 10 of a Sicilian and we already have no game. So this is what Magnus said about Report. He said, it's very hard for me to judge Report because he plays very well against everybody and then really poorly against me. So it makes it hard for me to be completely unbiased. But when he's on his form, he deserves to be a top 10 player. His understanding is just superb. Very nice thing, obviously, but my lord. I mean, this dude just straight up said, yeah, he plays really well against everybody, but against me, he's, nah, he just, he plays horribly. <laughs> I mean, the brutality of the honesty is amazing. I just, I, wow. And this is what he said about Fabiano. He said something along the lines of, Fabiano, three, four years ago, had really interesting opening ideas. Yes, that he kept bringing to the table. But then it was discovered on rechecking his ideas that they were just the top line of the Leela engine. <laughs> so all of Fabiano's cutting edge opening preparation or ideas were the top line of, uh, of Leela. And so it's like, it loses some of its allure. Now he did elaborate and he did say Fabiano still does bring some ideas to this, you know, he did say something nice, but like, my God, <laughs> this is just unbelievable. I mean, I was sitting there watching this like, am I, well, well, this is like, did he just take a couple shots before he sat down? He's like, you know what? I'm going to speak my mind. I love it. I, I don't know how you guys feel about it. I saw some debate that it's like beyond the threshold of being acceptable arrogance or what, I don't know, but I, that's what I'm saying. I wanna I want, I want hear what you all have to th say. Now, from this point forward, the game gets absolutely insane. So, uh, Fabi plays Rook F1. The point of Rook F1 is a potential F4, and also if this move happens, he doesn't have to lose his bishop, the bishop will slide back to the corner. Now you say, well, why didn't he just castle? Well, he didn't castle because what if he wants to like move these pawns? Right? And I mean, knight h4 will still hit the bishop, but now there is bishop to g5, potentially in the future. Bishop will still go to h1. But yeah, Fabio was like, well, I think I'm going to keep my option open. Maybe I will go castle queenside. And here, Report played a beautiful idea. He played bishop c6, and the idea of this move is not to develop, but rather play a5, a4. Completely unprovoked. White has not gone long. A5, A4 is not attacking anything, and yet it is still the best idea. A5, A4, Bishop, B4, Queen, A5, just not developing. Oh, you want your king in the center or there? Okay, fantastic. A5, A4 is coming, no matter what. You know what the craziest part about this position is? The engine says to castle. That's what it says. I don't know if it has, like, a horizon effect where it doesn't realize how dangerous the position is, but that's insane. That is an insane decision to just play directly into A5, F4, A4, F5, all right, A, B, F, G, Rook, A, 1, check, Knight, B, 1, H, takes G, 6, and just be like, yeah, this is the position that I want to play. I mean, the computer says that black is winning here, despite just being a full piece down. You don't have a mate. I mean, Queen, A, 8, for example, to go Queen, A, 2 is a possibility, but... Eh, life goes on. Like, this is not a good move to open up your king, apparently. Rook takes H, 2 comes... I mean, it's just... So Fabiano goes here. The idea is to maybe prevent queen h4 and also expand with f4, f5. But here comes a5, here comes f4, here comes a4. Will Fabiano play a5? Will he take on a4? He could have taken on a4. It was a possibility. But his problems are hardly over. There is a new a pawn. I mean, you're not going to castle into this. Are you insane, right? That you're not going to do this. So his problems are hardly over. I mean, he can take the pawn. He chooses rook d1 in the game. The king completely forgot how to castle. I mean, it looks like a, a guy who tried to move the rooks first while playing on chess.com, you know? Like, you're just sitting there and you're like, oh, if I play rook d1, it's going to be automatic castle. And then, no, no, absolutely not. No, the king is just stuck in the middle. It's just crazy. I mean, just a completely insane position after f4, a4. Um... I, I mean, f5 is also possible, but here comes the knight. This is not really something you want to invite. And here comes report on the diagonal. Bishop b4. Uh, white again here can play f5. I mean, just head spinning complications. Maybe you need a 30 minute game on this. I mean, a 30 minute video on this. I mean, f5 is just super dangerous. Ef5, ef5. The knight tries to plug the center. You can trade bishops that have been staring at each other for a while. You can even apparently, according to the engine, play king f2, king g1. Like an absolute piece of trash. Like it just, just scumbag engine line here. Castles king g1. Shut up and move your king to g1 manually. It's just, it, it hurts your brain. Okay, it hurts your brain for all this. We have queen d4 attacking g7, and report doesn't take the knight. But just says, take, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and take on G7, Fabi, do your worst.
Because the knight that's guarded here is by the pawn. I'm gonna play a3. What are you gonna do? Right? I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna play this move. Stockfish after queen d4 wanted report to take because of this, suddenly the pawn promotes almost. Like suddenly this is just, you know, castles and f5. I mean the knight. You know, pawn takes, like, pawn takes, the bishop is hanging, it's not possible anymore. And rook f5, there's no attack. So black can even just play, like, h4. I mean, a3, h4. Or knight h4, and then a3. That's why I said h4, because knight h4. Uh, but, uh, you know, white would take with the queen, obviously, and then, you know, black can castle, and then white can play b4 to... Pr I mean, it's just, uh, the position is a migraine. It's a migraine... And that's kind of why I suspect what happens in this game after a3, Fabiano realizes that this could this migraine could continue for a while. He plays king to f2, and after a b2, gets the knight out of the way just in time, just as the bulldozer was ready to extract him from the territory. And report shuts the door on the queen, and now threatens a repetition of moves as the queen is trapped. Why can take and escape? and try to do this, but Fabiano says, you know what, I've had just about enough of this position, I have absolutely no idea what the hell is going on. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think anybody ever knew in this game truly what was going on. Uh, these guys are friends, you know? I feel like these guys just uh, decided to hang out together, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, I mean, like, well, I don't know, maybe uh, smoke a hookah or something, or... Uh, some, some else. <laughs> just, just, I mean, this game, this game was, I, it, it was amazing, amazing. It was a shame it ended with a repetition, but it, 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 in some ways, it's a game neither guy really wants to lose because the candidates falls on a knife's edge. I mean, you really don't want to lose a game like this, and, and it's completely unclear. You play a chess.com blitz game entitled Tuesday, anything is possible. But my goodness, what a game! And just credit to Report, who is showing up to scrap with the black pieces, no Berlins, my dude is playing Sicilian, amazing. And here we come to the last game of the day. Hikaru with two out of four having a good event thus far and uh, Nepo having a dream event thus far, but according to Magnus, not playing very impressively. Uh, we have E4 from Hikaru and we have a Petrov defense. Uh, very similar, you will remember this position, uh, Ali Reza versus Duda. But in that game, Duda went for bishop f5 and Jan plays knight c6. This is one of the main lines applying pressure with the knight. Uh, we have castles, bishop e7, c4 targeting the pawn, knight b4 targeting the bishop. The bishop slides out of the way, doesn't want to get captured. All standard stuff. Uh, the theory here is just thousands of various games, but it is Hikaru who plays a sideline. He plays knight c3, he targets the knight, we have this and back, and in this position a couple of moves and a couple of plans have been played after rook e1 and rook 2 e8. Um, you can take on d5 and you can play bishop to f4, uh, and just various kind of central bishop moves. In this position, Hikaru plays a move that he played something like seven years ago, okay? Uh, and he played it in the World cha uh, US Championship against Varuja Nikobian, and he won that game. He played rook to a2. A very interesting move. Obviously, rook b2 to sidestep the bishop and target this. The rook has a job maybe on the b file. But also, the rook has a job potentially doubling up very quickly. So if the bishop moves and then the rooks double, white has a good position. Black has a choice. I think in that game, a, a Kobian played knight a5, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that game went cd5, queen d5, rook b2, something along these lines. In this game, Nepo played bishop back to f8. But it's kind of surprising that like Nepo wouldn't know that Naka played this because he's played this before with success, right? So bishop back to f8, now we trade and we attack the queen. In this position, we have queen d6, queen d7, and queen back to d8, all of which have the very big evaluation of 0.00. .00. But at this point, report, uh, not report, Nipomnishi plays queen to e4, which, good lord, is a provocative move. Now if Hikaru moves the bishop back to f1, the queen is under attack, and the best thing that the queen can do is wander into white's territory. And yes, it can hang around here and maybe even go to a1. White will then take on b7 and capture some pawns. Black will also try to capture some pawns. Pandemonium on the board as black tries to not just lose literally the entire house on the queen side. But queen e4, bishop f1, and the queen wandering to b1 seems like what yeah, you know, the idea is. 
But here, Jan goes here and gets his queen booted again, and the game is slowly slipping. The evaluation is 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. And Magnus said this. He said, what an opening disaster for Jan. It's very strange. Hikaru played the same sideline he played six years ago, and Jan decided to make a few natural good moves, and then decided... He cursed. Magnus cursed live on air. I'm not gonna do it. We got some parents watching, you know what I'm saying? I like to be family friendly on my YouTube channel, not always on Twitch. Magnus said, F this solid Petrov position, I'm gonna go get my queen chased around half the board instead. <laughs> that is scorched earth commentary. And it's true. What is going on with this queen? Why is it dancing around the board? But Jan is playing super quickly. So he takes only one, re-offers a queen trade, and goes here. And at this point, Hikaru started thinking and hesitating. He went from being only about 10-15 minutes difference on the clock to 30, to 40. He started thinking. He repeated moves once to get closer to the time control. Now he plays rook e3. The queen dances into b1. Hikaru plays d5, principled move. Why is Hikaru better here? Black is uber passive and white is very close to just getting this and winning the only problem is of course that he would also be losing his bishop so white has more space great coordination and an opportunity to potentially pick off some weaknesses in the long run black is playing without two pieces two pieces of blacks are on home squares the rook and the bishop and the knight is kind of passive the queen is god knows where computer here gives knight d4 this is the best move. Hikaru really lamented not playing this move. The game is far from over, but the game, you know, the game will be played onward. Instead, Hikaru went this way, and he said that he missed Jan's idea of rescuing the queen back to f6. I imagine Hikaru saw queen c2 and queen b6. It must have been this obscure reroute to, you know, gallop back and be like, oh, I'm safe. They didn't catch me. You ever play Manhunt? The game you gotta hide and the person tries, you know, hide and see, whatever, manhunt. That's what we called it on the New York streets. Manhunt, it's a brutal name for a game. But like you run, you run, oh my God, he saw me, but I'm out, I'm out of there, I'm too far. I so Hikaru was very upset that he had allowed this and the game began kind of, you know, slipping. Jan suddenly played top stockfish moves, knight to g6, reactivating the bishop. Hikaru ventured off to attack this. Again, computer here was giving g3, but at this point the game is slowly turning back to Jan. Knight a5, b6, the knight jumps in, and Jan plays bishop back to d7, targeting the knight. Hikaru attacks the queen, Jan goes here, Hikaru attacks the queen. I think you see where this is going, right? Queen f6, bishop c3, queen d6. And of course, Hikaru can still choose to play on. He can still repeat. He can try to, you know, pose some more problems. But there's a concept in chess of, I had a good position, okay? And I'm not sure I have a good position now. Just because I had a good position doesn't mean I need to... It doesn't mean I'm better now. I was better, maybe not now. Hikaru, obviously frustrated, time ticking, ends up repeating the moves and making a draw. But the craziest part is that it felt like Jan was maybe down a pawn or under pressure for most of this game. Jan does not have to repeat moves after bishop c3. Jan can go queen g5. Hikaru has like eight minutes to make 10 moves. And Magnus was so mad that this happened. So mad. He said, one thing he said about Jan, by the way, was uh, uh, w w through all of this, by the way, he said, Jan is getting back to his true self in the last few moves. He's playing poor moves quickly. Oh my God. He said he's getting back to his true self. Poor moves quickly. But obviously in the defense of things, you know, Jan has like a 40 minute time advantage. He could play on queen g5, bishop d. I mean, just something, right? He, the tide of the game is turning. And Jan did not even hit, think. He just repeated the moves instantly. The players made a draw, right? This is what Magnus said. He said, how do you play queen d6 in one second? That is so undisciplined. You gotta smell the blood in the water, dude. Be an effing shark. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, if, if I, I, I wasn't lying when I named the video what I named it, okay? Like, this was an incredible display of commentary by the world champion. It was such a statement. I mean, I don't know. I'm not trying to you know, turn this into anything it's not, but he said so much. He said so much during this broadcast, and it's just the level difference and the approach. It just, it just seems like Magnus is just in another level, really. And we, it's not, not, it's not anything we didn't know, but he's reminding that of us. Uh, he's reminding us of that throughout this commentary. So, oh, four draws in round number five. 
Um, couple of them not as exciting. You know, the Ferrugia game, not super exciting. The Ding game was tense for a moment. He had a chance. This game was just, I mean, I just, hardly a draw. I feel like both guys deserve a full point for their efforts. Uh, and yeah, I mean, a crazy miss by Hikaru. Not like a miss. I mean, but, you know, he could have applied pressure in a slightly different way. And imagine he would have won. He would have tied for first. Jan loses a game. I mean, who knows what happens. But... Tomorrow we have round number six, and good lord, we need Magnus back for commentary every day. I mean, I don't know if he's going to be as uh, pointed, as unhinged as he was today, but good god, that was just incredible. Honestly incredible. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Appreciate you all, as always, for hanging out with me, uh, regardless of how long you watch these recaps, and I'll catch you in the next one. Get out of here.